The 1920s were a great time to be a coaster lover. The economy was booming, engineers were innovating, and amusement parks were thriving. Legendary coaster designers like John Miller and Frederick Church installed groundbreaking throw machines across the globe, and the thrill-seeking public was eager for more. The year 1928 saw the construction of nearly 40 major roller coasters in the United States alone, and the future looked bright for amusement parks. Just one year later in 1929, the most disastrous stock market crash in U.S. history occurred, and the Great Depression that followed proved crippling for the amusement industry. The decade of wealth, excess, and post-war optimism was over, and dark days loomed for many Americans. The expansive, nearly four-decade-long span between the roaring 1920s and the coaster renaissance of the 1970s was a dark and rather interesting period in coaster history. While many once lucrative parks were forced to close during this time, others pulled through better than before, and coaster manufacturers remained active. Starting in the 1930s, we'll explore this period decade by decade, taking a look at the challenges and triumphs of each. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. In the wake of Black Tuesday, the U.S. unemployment rate rose to 23%, and personal income plummeted. The average American was struggling to get by, and the countless amusement parks scattered across the country saw a sharp decrease in attendance. Many parks were demolished or sold off as investors attempted to recoup their losses. Others offered free entertainment such as concerts or children's play areas to draw in guests. Still others were determined to offer new attractions, and a few noteworthy coasters were constructed during this time. Remember Herbert Paul Schmeck and the Philadelphia Toboggan Company? Well, they remained active during the Depression, building the famous Adora Park Wildcat in 1930. The defunct Wildcat at the original Elitch Gardens in Denver, as well as Yankee Cannonball at Canoby Lake Park in New Hampshire, both in 1936, as well as Roller Coaster, which opened at Idlewild Park in Pennsylvania in 1938. Edward A. Vettel, the latest in the line of a family of coaster designers at the time, designed numerous coasters during the 30s, including the Blue Streak at Canaet Lake Park in Pennsylvania, the defunct Zephyr located in New Orleans, Louisiana, and the Cyclone at Lakeside Amusement Park in Denver, Colorado. These three coasters were all constructed by the manufacturing firm National Amusement Device. Originally established in the 1920s, National Amusement Device, or NAD, interestingly rose to coaster prominence in the dark days of the Depression. Vernon Keenan, the man who famously designed the Coney Island Cyclone in 1927, partnered with NAD to design some noteworthy coasters during this time, including the Atom Smasher at Rockaway's Playland in New York, and the Million Dollar Coaster at Rocky Glen in Pennsylvania. Today, NAD is best known for their Century Flyer trains. These Art Deco-inspired trains can still be found today on Thunderbolt at Kennywood, Blue Streak at Conneaut Lake Park, and both the Big and Little Dipper at Camden Park in West Virginia. By 1939, the Great Depression began to diminish. Hope was returning to the American people, and the parks that survived the Depression began to place orders for new rides. However, this optimism would prove to be short-lived, as another world war was on its way. American life would change dramatically after the United States' entrance into the war in 1941. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. While the Depression years saw the construction of a few noteworthy coasters, few if any roller coasters opened during the Second World War. Many ride companies diverted their manufacturing efforts to the war effort, making it almost impossible for parks to build new rides, and very difficult to perform maintenance on currently operating ones. But parks stuck around, acting as a safe, affordable diversion for Americans who remained at home. A wave of relief and excitement swept over America after Armistice Day in 1945. Surviving amusement parks let out a sigh of relief as well. The end of the war meant that long overdue maintenance could be performed on their existing rides. In 1945, the Big Dipper at Geauga Lake, originally constructed in 1926 by John Miller, received an extensive renovation. By 1947, two years after Armistice Day, 
Members of the armed forces had returned home and settled down, and coasters began to be built anew. Herbert Schmeck and PTC survived the war, and built many iconic coasters during the late 1940s. One such coaster is the beloved Comet at Hershey Park, an excellent example of a Schmeck design coaster with its fast pacing and speed bumps. Another is the Rocket, built in 1947 at Playland Park in San Antonio, Texas. It was eventually relocated to a small park in Pennsylvania called Knobles, where it still operates today as the Phoenix, a coaster that regularly places high on top 10 lists for its fun-filled, airtime onslaught of a layout. In 1948, Schmeck and PTC built the Crystal Beach Comet, replacing Harry Traver's terrifying cyclone coaster. The Comet was relocated to the Great Escape in Lake George, New York in 1994, where it still thrills riders today. By the end of the 1940s, the aftermath of a nearly 15-year-long global depression became readily apparent. Many small local parks shut their doors. The larger parks that survived, such as Pittsburgh's Kennywood Park, Ohio's Cedar Point, Geauga Lake, and Euclid Beach Park, Chicago's Riverview Park, Denver's Lakeside Park, and Steeplechase Park in Coney Island, optimistically looked to the future. Despite a prosperous decade ahead of them, these parks would be met with many unexpected challenges. These are the 36 men who built this house. Another day, another 40 houses. Things were booming in the 50s. The economy, the suburbs, and the babies, to name a few. Unemployment was low, wages were high, and middle-class America had more money to spend than ever before. However, American tastes were changing, and much of that money was not being funneled into amusement parks. The arrival of television had a huge effect on the entertainment industry as a whole, offering cheap, in-home, modern entertainment to the American nuclear family. Another threat to parks during this time was their image. Traditional amusement parks were free to enter, with money only having to be spent on ride tickets, allowing parks to become hangout spots for gangs of unsupervised, rebellious post-war hooligans. In the 50s, many classic parks were struggling to survive. Meanwhile, in Southern California, a man was beginning to turn a dream of his into a reality. Inspired by the idyllic parks he visited as a kid, he imagined building a new type of amusement park, where rides housed in elaborately detailed film-like sets would tell stories in an exquisitely planned, family-oriented park. His name was Walter Elias Disney, and his park would open in 1955 as Disneyland. Despite some early problems, Disneyland soon entered into a world of its own. Featuring an upfront admission price, elegantly themed land sprouting from a central hub, and popular Disney characters, this was an amusement park unlike anything the world had ever seen. But what does this have to do with roller coasters? At first, nothing. Walt felt that the rickety contraptions had no place in his futuristic park. While parkers loved Walt's new rides, there was still a craving for thrills that only a coaster could provide. Eventually, Walt decided to give the coaster a chance, but in typical Disney fashion, the ride would not be traditional in any sense. Steel track coasters began to emerge in the mid-1950s. The first major steel track coaster was constructed in 1953 as Roller Coaster, located at Haneyashiki in Tokyo, Japan, being the first coaster built by the Japanese manufacturer Togo. Steel track coasters achieved worldwide fame with the advent of the Wild Mouse Coaster. These rides were simple, compact, and as their name implies, pretty wild. Cars traveled along flat steel running rails through perilous hairpin turns that, along with the car's extremely short wheelbase, made it feel as if the vehicle would be thrown off the track at any moment. While certainly a better fit for Disneyland than the traditionally loud and rickety wooden coaster, Walt had very high standards for his rides, and the staff at Disney soon realized that a Wild Mouse style coaster would not provide the smooth and comfortable ride Walt was looking for. Enter Carl Bacon and Ed Morgan, founders of a small manufacturing firm in California named Arrow Development. Walt, who had worked with the firm in the past to design ride systems for Disneyland, pitched an idea that he had while on vacation in Switzerland, a bobsled run down the side of the Matterhorn, and told the guys at Arrow to come up with a brand new steel coaster concept that would be quiet, comfortable, and feel completely safe to ride. 
In effect, Arrow was asked to reinvent the coaster, and they succeeded. In 1959, the Matterhorn bobsleds opened at Disneyland. In order to create a coaster that would satisfy THE Walt Disney, Arrow deviated from the flat Wild Mouse track and developed a tubular steel track, resulting in a smoother ride experience. To reduce the ride's noise, they coated the car's wheels with polyurethane, an industry first that has since become the standard. Finally, Arrow lowered the car's center of gravity, which made for a much more stable and safe-feeling ride experience compared to the Wild Mouse, whose car sat high above the rails. The ride was a massive success, and is still one of Disneyland's most popular attractions to this day. If we can spend $35 billion a year to fight an ill-considered war in Vietnam, our nation can spend billions of dollars to put God's children on their own two feet. While the Matterhorn bobsleds was revolutionary, its effect on the coaster industry was not immediate. The 1960s was a tumultuous time for America, with the Vietnam War, the anti-establishment counterculture movement, and the civil rights movement all lending to a sense of uneasiness amongst the American people. Put off by crowded metropolitan areas that had become more racially or ethnoculturally diverse, white people fled these areas to the suburbs, a phenomenon coined the white flight, and inner city parks suffered from low attendance. Over time, the poor reputations these parks suffered from during the 50s only worsened, with many being labeled as shabby or even dangerous. With attendance continuing to decline, parks that could afford to build new coasters did so in an attempt to draw in paying customers. Many parks reached out to good old PTC, who began working with a new designer in the 60s named John C. Allen. Cedar Point opened the John Allen design of Blue Streak in 1964, which stands today as the oldest operating coaster at the famous park. Swamp Fox at Family Kingdom in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and Cannonball at Lake Winnipesaukee in Georgia are other surviving examples of Allen and PTC's work from this decade. Unfortunately, many of PTC's 60s creations do not survive today. Allen's arguably most famous defunct creation is Mr. Twister, which operated at the old Elitch Gardens in Denver from 1965 to the park's closure in 1994. Other defunct PTC Allen design rides from this era include Riverview Park's Jetstream and Zingo at Bell's Amusement Park in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Kennywood's Thunderbolt is another notable coaster from the 60s. The Thunderbolt is a 1967 redesign of the John A. Miller-designed Pippin, a coaster that originally opened in 1924. Andy Vettel of the Vettel family of coaster builders worked with National Amusement Device to integrate a new collection of swooping drops and turns into the old ravine section of the ride, and a new coaster legend was born. Another coaster with an interesting history from this time period is the Wildcat at Fairyland Park in Kansas City, Missouri. Opened in 1967, this NAD ride closed only 10 years later when the park shut its doors in 1977. The ride sat dormant for an insane 14 years before it was moved to Frontier City in Oklahoma, where it still operates today under the same name. The period between the Great Depression and the early 1970s was perhaps the darkest era in roller coaster history. While some major parks such as Kennywood, Cedar Point, Geauga Lake, and Colorado's Lakeside Amusement Park survived this era, countless other famous parks like Chicago's Riverview Park, Coney Island's Steeplechase Park, and Cleveland's Euclid Beach Park were forced to close. Countless classic coasters were demolished, and parks cherished for generations were leveled across the country replaced by high-rises, strip malls, and other soulless commercial developments. Rick Kogan of the Chicago Tribune, speaking of Riverview Park, said, A great deal of life is about loss, of people and things. Most landmarks of our youth have vanished. So much of the city and the suburbs have been razed, paved over, obliterated. Still, some gone things remain so memorable that they stay with us, as if snuggled up with our DNA. Riverview is such a place. It's a sad case of not realizing what you had until it's gone. Wooden coasters are works of art, hand-built on-site by skilled craftsmen and meticulously designed by thoughtful engineers. It's truly a shame to see how many legendary rides were unceremoniously torn down during this time period. Let us take the time now to remember these fallen giants of the coaster world.
wake of this devastation, the 70s would see the construction of new theme parks, built to take the place of recently shuttered traditional amusement parks across the country, as well as the construction of a new coaster that single-handedly revitalized the industry, sparking renewed interest in amusement parks, and ushering in a new age of innovation, a new golden age of roller coasters. If you made it to the end of the video, leave a like, and consider subscribing if you want to see more theme park related videos. Until next time, thanks for watching.